All right, so we are going over the book, Speed Walking. We started speed running it, but really it's it's a speed walk. OCaml okay, programming, correct, efficient, beautiful. A lot of people just call it CS3110. And uh, we're currently on chapter four exercises. We started a few of them and we'll see how far we get today. Um, let's see, what did I end off? Yeah, okay, so I did the terse product thing. Uh, let's see if I want to do this next one. Write a function sum cube odd that computes the sum of the cubes of all the odd numbers between 0 and n inclusive. Do not write any new recursive functions. Instead, use the functionals map, fold, and filter. Yeah, it's not that interesting. Uh, sum cube odd. Rewrite to use the pipeline operator. Okay, I already know how to do that. Consider writing a function exists. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Sure. Basically a, an any or something like that. Well, I guess it's not quite. Yeah. It is any. Yeah. That is, it evaluates the same. When applied to an empty list, it evaluates to false. Write three solutions to this problem as we did above. Exist rec, which must be a recursive function that does not use the list module. Exist fold, which uses either a list off fold left or list off fold right, but not any other list module functions nor the rec keyword. Okay. And exist lib, which uses any combination of list module functions other than fold left or fold right and does not use the rec keyword. Okay, I guess we can do this as a warm up. It shouldn't be too hard. So it's just returning a bool. Um, all right, so I guess we'll start with exists rec. Fold seems hard if you want to get the evaluation order correct. Yeah, that's that's true. I guess since it's just a like at least one. It's okay. Hey, what's up, Nunes? Um, okay. Uh, we'll just start with let exists rec, which is going to take a predicate and a list and return a bool. I guess we could do the function keyword like this. Um, since we have the whole predict. Still not VIP. <sighs> rough, rough. You'll get there eventually. You'll get there eventually. Um, and then basically this is just, what, if we have an empty list, we return false. And then otherwise we have head and tail and Um, you're real close, Prophet. Um, and then we would say something like, can you use, can I do this when PH, can I just return true? Or can I not use P in the match since it's not like part of the actual match statement? Um, it works. Okay. That's nice. Early, early return, essentially. In this case, you can put any expression after the when. Okay. I just didn't know if there was some weird scope thing. Uh, it might help if I actually just like, I always forget the rec keyword. I've done that so much going through these. Always forget the rec keyword. Uh, H tier exists rec P T. I think that'll do it. Um, I'm glad I did this one cause it's easy. <laughs> you still forget rec after like two years. It is, it's not, it's just not, you know, you're not used to that in, in any other, I mean, I know some languages have that, but. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but 
that's not uncommon for me to not think of something off the top of my head anyway. All right, so uh, let's just say exist rack equals, what can I do? Can I just do this? Something like that. Um, I just forget if that works. Um, we'll say one, two, three, which should return false. And if we put a zero there, it turns true. Yay. Uh, let's see the one. Exists fold uses either fold left or fold right, but not any other list module function nor the rec keyword. Okay. That's going to be different. Uh, let exists fold. Uh, we'll do P and we'll do list and i guess i'm just going to do i guess i need to define my fold function that might be the easiest way to start i wonder if i want to define it outside of it i guess it doesn't really matter uh sure we'll just go with fold left i think that's what i want i'll start with fold left um and this is just going to take oh yeah i always forget i have to look at the order of operations for fold left what do we got we have our function, and then we have our init, and then we have the list. Okay. List.foldLeft, fun. Uh, I usually say something like ack. It's not really h. I guess we'll call it x. Sure. Why not? Um, And this is going to be false. And I guess this is going to be, well, end list, sure. Um, fun ack x. I have p, so then it's just if p x, then true, else false. I think that's right. Uh, I don't need the list since I could just use currying. And let's see. Did I do it right? Exists bold. Okay. Let's take the zero off. All right. Looks good. Um, oh, I'm really dumb, aren't I? I'm really dumb. Whoops, not what I meant to do. I wrote, I wrote this whole thing when my, when I literally have a predicate right here. <sighs> nice. Um, so, and then the other thing is, of course, I don't actually care what this ack is. Does this work for... It's so short now, I'll just put it on one line. No, you can't do that. Exist fold, exist fold. Nice. That's a nice little function. Um... Of course, in Haskell, we just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Prophet, I forgot the name of the, the function. I forgot, I forgot the function that does this. Oh my gosh, I can't believe that. Let f x y equals y. I forgot what that is.
const. That's it. It's const. But it might be, is it fxyy or is it fxyx? I can't ever remember. I think it's fxyy, right? So in Haskell, we'd usually do something like that, and then const is fxyx. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So then we do, we do const, and then nice try. And then we do flip, and then we just comp it all. And we'd be like p dot const dot flip or something close to that const. Let's say p dot flip const. There we go. That's how we do in Haskell. Something like that. If we wanted to be cool. Um. I was just saying that instead of using the anonymous function, but it was just a random, random rabbit trail in my head. Okay. <clears throat> so exist fold looks good. Okay. And the last is exists lib. Um, And what is that? ExistLib uses any combination of list module functions other than fold left or fold right and does not use the rec keyword. Okay. So I'll probably have to look at, can you ignore ac? Um, yeah, in this, in this one I can, it works. Oh, can I? I can't ignore ACK. You're right. You're right. You're right. It doesn't work. Okay, so I was on the right track. I actually, it worked. That's hilarious. The only reason it worked, watch. If we put zero here, it's not going to work anymore. Nice. Only reason it worked is because my last case was the passing case classic here i was trying to be fancier than i thought i than i actually should have been um okay so we are going to say if px then true else ack there we go um Of course, I could just do a logical or, I guess. I guess that's one way I could make it terser. I could do, I think that would work, right? It's a little nicer. Good call out, good call out chat. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah, that's a little bit better. You know, like working logic. Working logic is a good idea. Uh, okay. So exists lib uses any combination of list module functions other than fold left or fold right and does not use the rec keyboard. So obviously we could do like a filter and length is greater than zero, but I feel like there's probably something better in list than that. No, this is not what I thought I was going to. Here we go. Uh, do, 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 probably in list scanning. Yeah, there's an actual list exists. So it didn't even say that I can't use list.exists. So can't I just, <laughs> so technically we would be okay. Let me make sure everything, yeah, that's that's the right argument order to do this. There we go, we, we solved it. That's probably the trick question there. Nice. Um, classic, classic college prof 
putting in a, a question where somebody probably would do something more complicated, but it's literally just using the actual library thing, li library method. Love it. Account balance, write a function which, given a list of numbers representing debits, detects them from an account balance and finally returns the remaining amount in the balance. I don't really think that matters. One second. Okay. Um, maybe I should do it just because I messed up my exist function and thought I was just being so great at it. Um, I guess the point is to like really cement in the difference between fold left and fold right. Okay, sure. Why not? Uh, let balance left will be in terms of fold left. Um, so I guess we'd have the initial balance and our list of debits. And then this is supposed to be This is not that hard because of the way that it works. Like, let me think, let me think. Am I silly? It's kind of funny because he does, since he doesn't like actually provide test examples, it does make it a little bit unclear exactly what he's asking, but I think this is what he's asking is that I would do list.foldLeft fun b d and then it would just be B minus D. I think that's what he's asking based on my my reading of it. Love love that Ant is still alias does poke HP. We're just leaving it there. Um, Funshaw one X equals X. Yeah. List dot fold left fun b d b minus d. I think that's correct. And then our init is our b, and then we pass our debits. And of course, with fold left, I always forget. I don't actually have to put it here. I don't have to name it. It's kind of nice to have the name sometimes, though. Just just saying. Just saying. Sometimes that is nice to name your arguments. Balance left. It's funny that that actually means something besides the fact that I'm using fold left. Um, let's see. Maybe we should just say let B equals 500. And then let Debs equals uh, let's say 50, 125, which means that we should have an ending balance of 325. And then if we say balance left, B Debs, we should have 325. Nice. Um, and let's just make sure that I didn't do, I mean, I, I know I wouldn't here, but like maybe, maybe checking that it works with negative is a, is a good idea, uh, for other implementations. Let balance right eh, be this time. I do have to declare a list. Oh yeah. We're calling it debits. I remember things. I forgot the equal sign list dot fold, right? Fun B D B minus D. And then this has the list and then the B. I should have just called it list because that's what I'm used to typing. 
Obviously, these don't really need to be on different lines, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, balance, right. B dabs. Okay. This is why you have to actually think about things. Um, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I forgot um, something, obviously. Um, so I know that's true. I messed up the whole fold right thing. So does fold, I, I forgot that fold right, does the, does the function actually switch your things? I guess it makes sense. So do we have to do this? I'm guessing that's what I did wrong. Oh man, I just read this and I still, since I'm so used to just using reduce and closure, Fold right is the more natural fold, really. It's just constructor substitution. Yeah. Um, did I do this wrong again? That's what I'm interested in. B dubs, yes. Okay, there we go. So it does, it does do it the other way. Yeah, I mean, I get that it's more natural. I'm still not. I mean, I get I guess that's why fold right and fold left have the different argument orders for list and in it as well. But yeah. It still kind of throws me off just because I'm so used to my reduce functions having those flipped. But I mean, it's not like it's that hard. It's just, I, I'm not used to writing fold left and fold right. I'm just so used to like accumulator comes first and then my list element, you know? Uh, okay, and then balance rec, which should, should give us a little hint that we might need to do this. And then we could do B equals function. Sure, should be fine. And if our, once our list is empty, we're just gonna return B. And until then, we should be doing B minus H. Uh, balance rack. <sighs> Yeah, yeah, totally. No, I get I get what you're saying. Um We're getting there. I mean, it makes more sense if you think of it in like another in other terms, right? What am I trying to say? Like if you were just like constructing a list or something instead of like an end, I don't know. Then it, to me, in my head, it makes more sense. <laughs> Maybe not to anyone else. Uh, okay. Anyway, balance rack uh, B minus H. That should be right. But you hate me because I probably need friends. No. You still hate me. What did I do wrong? Integer subtraction. Yeah, this is integer subtraction. You're not you're not wrong. Um, but an expression was expected of type poke HP. Okay, so what did I do wrong? Oh, I'm so I'm I'm dumb. I'm dumb. I forgot to actually pass the tail. It might help when you're doing typical cons pattern matching to pass the tail. Okay, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the most helpful error message I've ever seen, right? Um, balance rack, okay, cool, let's 
do 100 and let's do that for a balance right too to make sure i didn't make any weird weird assumptions about positivity i don't know how i could have but just just to make sure um okay okay that that was good some simple stuff get my brain going library uncurried here's an uncurried version of list.nth sure in a similar way write uncurried versions of these three library of these library functions no i'm not i'm not gonna do that <laughs> it's it's not helpful to anybody no i'm sure it's helpful to somebody um, map composition show how to replace any expression of the form list.map f list.map g list with an equivalent expression that calls list.map only once yeah the the difficulty scales are pretty pretty interesting this is a this is a two star to be able to literally replace your arguments with just a, a tuple essentially i mean but that's fine. Um, one star was, I, I don't even remember. I don't even remember. What was one star? Did Here's a one star. Use fold left to write a function product left that computes the product of a list of floats. I think that's harder than the other one. I mean, or at least the same difficulty. I don't know. I don't know how that's easier. It's so random. So random. Uh, okay. I actually, let's see. Show how to replace any expression of the form list.mapf list.mapg list with an equivalent expression that calls list.map only. Oh, he's just saying compose f and g. Okay. We don't need to we don't need to write that out. No, get rid of your dumb notes. All right. Yeah. You compose f and g. That's that's the answer to that one. More list fun. <sighs> write functions that perform the following computations. Each function that you write should use one of fold map filter to choose which of those to use. Think about what the computation is doing. <laughs> Wait, which one? <laughs> oh, if you have effects, those aren't equivalent. Yeah, but I that is what he's telling you to do. Um. It is, it is kind of funny. I mean, unless you, it, but I'm right though. Like that's what he's asking for, even though it's not the same because there's not purity. Un. Okay, good. Yeah. Unbound IO. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. True in Haskell. Write functions that perform the following computations. Each function that you write should use one of list.fold, list.map, or list.filter. To choose which of those to use, think about what the computation is doing. <laughs> Here's a random thought. It has nothing to do with, with this, just what we were just talking about. Like, is there a language? I know people don't like Haskell's approach to purity sometimes because it's inconvenient. <clears throat> but like what if by default all functions were pure and then you had to add an annotation to it you had to use a keyword to make them impure is there any language that does that it sounds kind of nice i don't i actually don't mind the way haskell does it you know coca okay I'm not surprised that somebody has thought that thought before. I like that because I, I get pragmatically, it's really nice to just, you don't have to change any types. You're not doing anything. If you just want to print some shit, you're good, right? I get that that can be helpful. Um, but yeah. Surprisingly, it has pros and cons. Uh, to choose which of those to use, think about what the computation is doing, combining, transforming, or filtering elements. Okay, I think this is not 
going to be hard. Find those elements of a list of strings whose length is strictly greater than three. We'd use filter. I'm not going to write that. Add 1.0 to every element of a list of floats. That's a map. And given a list of string stirs and another string sep, produce the string that contains every element of stirs separated by sep. For example, given inputs hi by and comma produce hi by. Being sure not to produce an extra comma either at the beginning or end of the result string, which would be interesting to do. Um, yeah, okay. So you could do that with, with fold. Okay, I'm not going to write those. Um, kind of unfortunate how it interacts with evaluation order. Yeah, for sure. Okay, one second. Okay, a list. We're not, I'm not bothering spending brain power on a lists. Valid matrix. A mathematical matrix can be represented with lists and row major representation. This matrix one 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 nine eight seven would be represented as the list one 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 nine eight seven. Let's represent a row vector as an nth list. For example, nine eight seven is a row vector. A valid matrix is an nth list list that has at least one row, at least one column, and in which every column has the same number of rows. There are many values of type nth list list that are invalid. For example, implement a function is valid matrix nth list list bool that returns whether the input matrix is valid unit test the function good luck okay uh yeah okay we can do this Let me just copy the test case here. Let matrix equals this and invalid would be invalid matrix. Okay, that works. Um, that is valid matrix. Uh, I'd probably just want to do this recursively. Just think about it. Just to make it easy. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just do it recursively. Um, I forgot. It has at least one row and at least one column. Okay. So... Yeah, I guess maybe I could do it. Just think about this for a second. I guess we'll make this the normal one. And then we say something like valid matrix. Um, I mean, basically, we need to capture the the fur the shape of the first row, right? So, how do I want to do that?
I mean, I can do something like this. List.length. The first, but if it doesn't even have that element, then that doesn't work. So I don't know. Uh, let's just say zero as our initial state. There's probably something better, but I'm not I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> um we'll just call that L for fun. Um and match M with, I could have switched the L and the match to make it a little bit different. So if it's this or this, well, let me think, what am I actually going through and doing? I kind of forgot to think through this a little bit better. I don't need to go through the whole matrix. Let's see. No, I guess I guess that works. I'll just keep going and see and see what happens. We'll just say that's false. And then I think I can do this. Does that work? No, that's just going to get the head and the tail in the first element. That's not what I want. I haven't done matrix stuff in a while, and it's a little annoying. I think it makes more sense to go through each element. I think I'm just going to do this in for all, and then I don't have to think about it. <laughs> okay. Um, checks if all elements of the list satisfy the predicate F, right? Okay. I'm just going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to just do it in terms of for all. And then I don't have to think about, I don't have to think so hard. How does that sound? Um, so let's just say first equals, oh yeah, that's why I didn't want to do this because it might not match, but that's okay. We can just do this. Um, match M with, if it's this, then it's false. Otherwise, <sighs> Uh, we can say H T and this is a little silly, I guess. Um, yeah, they said, they said an empty matrix is invalid because it said it has at least one row and at least one column. So if if the if it's empty in the first part, right? That means that it has no columns. Depending on how you look at it. Um List dot for all fun. Uh, what is this considered a row? Fun R is um, oh yeah, that's where I made this kind of confusing. How do I I mean, it can do it this way. Basically, what I'm trying to do is list.length, because who doesn't who doesn't want to use list.length in this situation? Equals list.length r. Okay. 
Oh, did the stream cut out for a second? Oh, no. Are we really back? Okay, we're back. I think we're back. Okay. I don't know when I cut out. I did answer your question about the empty matrix. I don't know. I don't know if that came through. Okay, here we go. Um, mm hmm, mm hmm. It's definitely the right thing to do here. And then we just say T. Does that work? Yeah, that works. It's ugly. I don't think this is this is a nice way of implementing is valid matrix. <laughs> Yeah, what's up, Whensically? This is so bad, especially since this is constant. Or not, it's constant, it's linear. Um, <laughs> doing it like this every single time is pretty bad. Um, I guess I guess I should say let L equals Yeah. <laughs> You're thinking that's rather elegant. Oh, well, good. Uh, I guess this is a little bit better if I say let L equals list at length H. Or I could I could make it a just a basic product. No, I don't know why I said let L. Um, oh, because it's length. Duh. Let L is list at length H. And I don't know. We'll just rewrite it this way and see if I like it any better. Um, L equals, I mean, if we had a nice composition operator, it would also make this a lot nicer, of course, if we just composed some of that. Um, now what case does this not work for? It doesn't work if, okay. It doesn't work if list.length is, is zero. So technically, according to the prompt, we'd have to say if L equals zero, then false, else this. You feel so tempted to write the BQN versions of these. <laughs> it's not too bad. Uh, it's, I really like my other one that I wrote actually that, that had worse Worst performance. Um, this is pretty ugly. It can float out the list dot length h on its own. Yeah. Purity certainly makes the compiler implementation a little bit easier, doesn't it? Compiler optimizations and stuff. <clears throat> uh this isn't terrible i mean technically based on the prompt the first one was incorrect i guess i could have done it this way we could make it a little bit less uh verbose if we did um, if we did that, right? Uh, so this is also false. So as long as there is a single element, and obviously I could, I could make this better. There we go. And then I don't need this. And that's not so bad. And of course, if I didn't want the optimization, I could make it all just the three lines again. Uh, let's see if it actually works. 
Uh, oh, I also I can get rid of the, I can use the function keyword instead. That'll be nicer. All right. Saved a line. Code golf. Not really code golf. Okay. Maybe it works, or maybe my test cases suck. Um, of course, we're pretty darn sure that this is uh, going to work. Looks good. <laughs> works 100% of the time when you have two naive test cases. Um, OK, valid matrix. Let's go. Not bad. <sighs> yeah, I did three out of three. So good. Row vector add. Implement a function add row vectors for the element wise addition of two row vectors. For example, the addition of 111 and 987 is 1098. I don't care about this. Oh, but then you get to use list.map too. Oh, because they have they have a map is map too. I didn't even know this. This is probably good for me to know. Um Oh, I see. For all two lets you take two lists and map two lets you take two lists. Okay. So that's that's what that um I don't even see map two. There it is. Iterators on two lists. It's got its own section. Raises invalid argument if the two lists are determined to have different lengths. That's reasonable. Okay, cool. It's good to know these exist. I'm not gonna bother writing the function, but it's good to know that those exist. Right, right. That's what I was thinking. I couldn't remember how it handles that. Um, but I kind of remember that being the case because that's what uh, zip does. Like if you wanted to, I forget what zip does exactly. I just remember it takes two lists and cuts off one of them <laughs> until it hits the until it hits the end of uh, the length of one of the lists. Does it just concatenate? I can't remember. Um, whatever the lazy thing to do is. Yeah, that's a good point, Char. If you return to maybe or either you streaming on lazy lists and throwing an arrow is worse. Yeah, for sure. Zip is zip with, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, that is what I was thinking of. Cause map two is zip with basically, is that correct? With slightly different behavior. Um, Cool. Thanks, thanks for that. Makes me think that, you know, I remember some things about Haskell, how about it? Okay, let's get back to it. Uh, row vector add uh, zip is called list.combine in OCaml. Yeah, I bet you're right. What does combine do? But they have to have different lengths. Yeah, I do kind of hate that actually. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. I kind of get the point, but it's like, I guess, I guess it's just like a different philosophy, right? Like it's kind of like, do you want this to work more in, I guess you could say possibly unexpected ways um, versus, versus not? Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Is I, I could see this like preventing bugs that you didn't know you had, 
but uh, the base version returns a result. Yeah, that makes sense. Classic base. All right. Um, row vector add. I don't remember where we were at. Oh, yeah, we just talked about map two. That's what we were doing. Okay, matrix add. Not going to worry about all of those. Okay. One matrix function was enough for today. Uh, okay, chapter five, modular programming. Since we're supposed to be speed something, uh, this book, we'll, we'll skip a couple of those exercises. Modular programming. When a program is small enough, we can keep all the details of the program in our heads at once. Yeah. That's not true for me. Speak for yourself. That's, that's, the, that's the saying I was looking for. Uh, but real world applications can be many order of magnitude larger than those we write in college classes. They are simply too large and complex to hold all their details in our heads. They are also written by many programmers. <laughs> uh, this is too funny. It's just too funny just because I'd never like been in like CS program, you know? So like reading these words is like, this is what the industry is like. And it just sounds like it's coming from this like completely foreign perspective of like, oh, really? I had no idea. Real world applications, multiple programmers. This is amazing. Do you have any papers on that? I'd like to read a paper on that, sir. Um... One key solution to managing complexity of large software is modular programming. The code is composed of many different code modules that are developed separately. This allows different developers to take on discrete pieces of the system and design and implement them without having to understand all the rest. Sure. I don't think this is going to be too helpful for me to read. Rather than have to think about every other part of the program when developing a code module, we need to be able to use local reasoning. That is reasoning about just the module and the contract it needs to satisfy with respect to the rest of the program. Fair. If everyone has done their job, sure, sure. Uh, we must use abstraction to make it manageable to think about the program. Abstraction is simply the removal of detail. I guess that's one way of, of putting it. Sure. A well-written program has the property that we can think about its components abstractly. Modules are abstracted by giving specifications of what they are supposed to do. Going to talk about some MLIs, aren't we? Okay, talking about Java interfaces. If you don't know what a Java interface is, good for you. Developers working with a module take on distinct roles. Sure, sure, sure. We can skip through most of this. Module systems. Un momento. I don't, I don't hate Java. There's a lot of things I hate about the way Java applications are done but it has some good parts for sure a lot more good parts than a lot of other languages that people stan all day long um five dot one module systems checked exceptions is nice for sure I mean, it's just funny and it's like, it's classic and I know like Java OP, all that stuff, but like, um, and that that's like their whole marketing shtick and I'm not saying it's a, the best language or anything like that, but, uh, what am I saying? Most of the things I hate about Java have to do with like, the Java ecosystem and community and not the language itself. That's all I'll say about that. JN Avila, thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Hope you're doing well, y'all are. The, Pat the Patagonia stan 
himself. A programming language's module system is the set of features it provides in support of modular programming. Below are some common concerns of module systems. We focus on Java and OCaml in this discussion, mentioning some of the most related features in the two languages. <laughs> they make opening a file and reading from it look harder, look harder than Haskell does. <laughs> that's not that's not untrue. I mean, there's a lot of boilerplate in Java too. And I mean, the, the syntax is verbose, all those things. But I mean, you know, not, not as bad as it used to be. I haven't used Java since Java 8. I mean, technically I work on the JVM because I use Clojure, but like as far as the actual language. So I don't know what it's like now. Java 8 definitely had some better models to make the syntax a lot more terse. <laughs> a namespace provides a set of names that are grouped together are usually logically related and are distinct from other namespaces. That enables a name foo in one namespace to have a distinct meaning from foo in another namespace. A namespace is thus a scoping mechanism. Namespaces are essential for modularity. Without them, the names that one programmer chooses could collide with the names another programmer chooses. In Java, classes and packages group names. In OCaml, structures, which we will soon study, are similar to classes in that they group names. But without any of the added complexity of object-oriented programming that usually accompanies classes, Constructors, static versus instance members, inheritance, overriding, this, etc. Structures are the core of the OCaml module system. In fact, we've been using them all along without thinking too much about them. I've been thinking a hell of a lot about them, okay? Abstraction. An abstraction hides some information while revealing other information. Abstraction thus enables encapsulation, aka information hiding. Usually abstraction mechanisms for modules allow revealing some names that exist inside the module but hiding some others. Abstractions therefore describe relationships among modules. There might be many modules that could be considered to satisfy a given abstraction. Abstraction is essential for modularity because it enables implementers of a module to hide the details of the implementation from clients thus preventing the clients from abusing those details. In a large team, the modules one programmer designs are thereby protected from abuse by another programmer. It also enables clients to be blissfully unaware of those details. So in a large team, no programmer has to be aware of all the details in all the modules. In Java, interfaces and abstract classes provide abstraction. In OCaml, signatures are used to abstract sig structures by hiding some of the structures, names, and definitions. Signatures are essentially the types of structures, okay? Code reuse. A module system enables code reuse by providing features that enable code from one module to be used as part of another module without having to copy the code. Code reuse thereby enables programmers to build on the work of others in a way that is maintainable. When the implementer of one module makes an improvement in that module, all the programmers who are reusing that code automatically get the benefit of that improvement. Code reuse is essential for modularity because it enables building blocks that can be assembled and reassembled to form complex pieces of software. In Java, subtyping and inheritance provide code reuse. In OCaml, functors, functors, and includes enable code reuse. Functors are like functions in that they produce new modules out of old modules. Includes are like an intelligent form of copy-paste. They include code from one part of a program and another. Got it. Um, yeah. Good to know. It's just built different, okay? Like what what if it's just built different? Okay. Funny. 
5.2 modules. We begin with a couple examples of the Okamo Okam module system. Before diving into the details, the structure is simply a collection of definitions such as uh, struct letting x, x equals x plus one, type primary color equals red, green, blue, exception, oops. In a way, the structure is like a record. The structure has some distinct components with names, but unlike a record, it can define new types, exceptions, and so forth. Okay. By itself, the code above won't compile because structures do not have the same first class status as values like integers or functions. You can't just enter that code in UTOP or pass that structure to a function, etc. What you can do is bind the structure to a name. And that's when we have module, my module, blah, blah, blah. And the output from OCaml gives us the signature. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Good point. The this indicates that my module has been defined and it has been inferred to have the module type that appears to the right of the colon. That module type is written as signature. Okay. Uh-huh. One second. Uh, the use of the word specification is perhaps confusing since many programmers would use that to wor word to mean the comment specifying the behavior of a function. Oh, right, sure. But if we broaden our site a little, we could allow that the type of function as part of its specification. Okay, so he's just he's trying to make you feel better about like the words that we use. Okay, that's fine. Whatever. Um, Galena for the win. What is Galena? I don't actually know. The definitions in a module are usually more closely related than those in my module. Often a module will implement some data structure. For example, here's a module for stacks implemented as linked lists. Okay, module list stack equals, you've got an empty, you've got an is empty, you've got a push, you have an empty exception, you have a peak, and you have a pop, okay? Okay. Oh, it's the type language of cock, okay. That's right. I knew I'd heard the the word before. We can use that module to manipulate a stack. Sure. Mm-hmm. Modules are not objects. Uh, sure. List act dot push to. So opening a module, we kind of already know about that. By writing list stack dot e, all the names from list stack become usable in e without needing to write the prefix list stack each time. Could be using the pipeline operator. Now we can read the code left to right without having to parse parentheses. Nice. Uh, modules are considerably more basic than classes. So basic. A module is just a collection of definitions in its own namespaces. In list stack, we have some definitions of functions, push, pop, etc., and one value empty. So whereas in Java, we might create a couple stacks using code like this, in OCaml, the same stacks could be created as follows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Looks good, looks good. The module definition keyword is much like the let definition keyword that we learned before. The OCaml designers hypothetically could have chosen to use let module instead of module to emphasize the similarity. The difference is just that let binds a value to a name, whereas module binds a va module value to a name. Yes. I wish they would have called it let module. Can't we all agree that that would have been better? They do use let module for local definitions. Yeah, fair. I was being sarcastic. Um, sure. So this is the syntax. Uh, I guess this actually might be worth reading through since modules are one of the things that like, I probably don't know enough about. Uh, module items inside a structure can include let definitions, type definitions, and exception definitions, as well as nested module definitions. Module names must begin with an uppercase letter, and idiomatically, they use camel case rather than snake case. Not even snake case. Not, we don't call it snake case. I guess it is capitalized snake case. I was thinking it was cobra case, but that's not true. Anybody, anybody got a good name for this? All right. But a more accurate version of the syntax would be. Oh yeah, no, this, yeah, I was, I was poking on this and I totally went over the other, the other faux pas that this is Pascal case and not camel case. This guy must have tenure. Unbelievable. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, but a more accurate version of the syntax would be module module name equals module expression, where struct is just one sort of module expression. Oh, camel case. <laughs> oh, camel case is where you... <laughs> no. It's where you uh, capitalize the first two letters of anything that you're writing, even if it doesn't make sense even if you don't need to. That would be so great. I'm gonna start doing that. This is going to be module name. Perfect. Way more, way more OCaml-ish. Okay. More accurate version of the syntax would be module name equals module expression, where a struct is just one sort of module expression. Here's another, the name of an already defined module. For example, you can write module L equals list if you'd like a short alias for the list module. We'll see other sorts of module expressions later in this section and chapter. The definitions inside a structure can optionally be terminated by double semicolon as in the top level. Sometimes that can be useful to add temporarily if you're trying to diagnose a syntax error. It will help OCaml understand that you want two definitions to be syntactically separate. After fixing whatever the underlying error is though, you can remove the double semicolon in one use case is if you want to evaluate an expression as part of a module. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Oh, but it can be written without that anyway. I don't understand why he said it that way then. Okay, sure. We'll just, oh, I get it. I, I missed the difference. Here you just use let underscore equals assert. Okay, I get it now. Structures can also be written on a single line with optional between items for readability. Uh-huh, sure. Empty signature is permitted, yeah. Um, <laughs> Just see if there's anything interesting. Yeah, I guess we'll read this. It's somewhat helpful to know. 
We already know that expressions are evaluated to values. Similarly, a module expression is evaluated to a module value or just module for short. The only interesting kind of module expression we have so far, wow, that was loud, from the perspective of evaluation anyway, is the structure. Evaluation of structures is easy. Just evaluate each definition in it in the order they occur. Because of that, earlier definitions are therefore in scope in later definitions, but not vice versa. Oh, okay. It's not as interesting as I thought. I mean, I guess it's good to know that order order of definition, order of declaration, however you want to say that, matters. Of course, mutual recursion can be used if desired. Let's go. <laughs> Purity fixes this. <laughs> <laughs> Alice all day long. Purity fixes this. <laughs> She's not wrong, you know? Static semantics. The structure is well typed if all the definitions in it are themselves well typed according to all the typing rules that we have already learned. Okay. All good. Uh, it was worth reading the syntax section of that one this time. Scope and open. I'm guessing, okay, yep. Access the names using dot operator. We already do this. Of course, from outside the module, the name X by itself is not meaningful. Yep, you can open M. We know about open. There is a special module called stdlib. I know, code spent. I know. Yeah, it is. It is, in fact, it is, in fact, a Samsung product. And like most Samsung products, it is apt to catch on fire. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, no one's no one's gotten that one yet. That one's good. All right. Um. Funny story. Uh, one time Togglebit on his stream was talking about these crappy smart TVs that are you know, kind of cheap and the software sucks and all this stuff. And he just wants a quality product. And, uh, the, this TV was actually sent to me for free for upgrading a phone. I literally just upgraded a phone. I didn't buy a new like phone plan. I, I upgraded a phone, my daughter's phone. And, uh, I even got the phone quote unquote for free with three years of Verizon contract, essentially three years of Verizon contract. Um, and then they sent me a free Samsung 4k smart TV. Scary world, scary world. When they're literally giving away 4k TVs for phones that you've also kind of kind of gotten for free it felt pretty weird anyway interesting interesting life sometimes uh i miss something i skipped over this on purpose because i did not care yeah, good. Okay. Uh, studlib is always open. In earlier days, this module was named pervasives. Wow. That's hilarious. Pervasives. Yeah, exactly, Code. I, I think it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, the value on the TV is only like $450. It's not an expensive television by any means. Like if you bought it from Samsung site, it's like 450 or something like that in the US, obviously. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's part of it. It's just funny that they're willing to give you a TV just, just so that you have, just so that they're in your home and they can, it comes with all their channels. It has live TV channels. It's very weird. It's the weirdest thing. It's like, 
it's like cable but not cable for free with ads it's it's strange i don't use any of those channels but i don't know the whole smart tv market is is kind of weird um pervasive what a great name A Pluto deal they use? Yeah, not surprised. Uh, an open is another sort of module item, so we can open one module inside another. Yes, we. I thought we just went over this. <laughs> <laughs> Except after our power outage, then all of a sudden. Yeah. What happens to me is sometimes I just hit the wrong button on my remote and then I get really scared because just some random shit pops up, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God, what is this? I'm so not used to, you know, like things I didn't ask for showing up on the TV. Um, you know, I guess I'm just like a zoomer in that way, just like them. <clears throat> since list is open the name map from it is in scope but what if we wanted to get rid of the string dot as well then we open it maybe oh right because string also defines the name map blah 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 okay so just basic like scope etc etc uh and so then he's just explaining the string dot parens thing. <laughs> That's so rough, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's like if he if they give all their products away for from for free and they're all a little bit sus. Like, are you really going to go out there and buy another buy another Samsung? I don't know. I was tempted to get their little flip phone, though. It's pretty cool, the folding screens. I kind of like it, even though apparently they break easily. I need to upgrade my phone. Uh, I don't really care that much. I don't use it for anything that, that difficult. Even that thing is a letdown. That's hilarious. I'm literally looking at my Samsung soundbar that sits on my desk that I never use. Uh, I think it was more like a four or five hundred dollar one that I got on a Black Friday deal for like a hundred and twenty bucks or something at one point. But it's it's not it's not that great. I haven't even bothered hooking it up to the TV because I don't think it's going to do any better sound than the, the, than the TV does, honestly. Ah, uh, whatever. Consumer electronics kind of suck these days. Yeah, exactly, Char. Yeah, I think that would be cool. Even, even just for the fun part of like you answer a phone call and you like flip the phone open. That's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, seriously. Paying full price for things. That would hurt me. <clears throat> um, this is really funny that he says the admittedly strange syntax for that is let open M and E. Like to me, that's not that's not strange syntax at all. That just fits right into what I would expect. I don't see why that's strange to people. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah. Let open in. Good to know. I've seen that. Uh, let's now see how to write those module types ourselves. I know how to write module types, so I'm going to kind of skim through this. Uh, 
Uh, right, so adding the type annotation to the module to use our, our type that we declared. Uh, I think one of the main things that people get wrong, they get confused about is the difference between MLA and MLI, which we haven't even gotten to in the book yet. But a lot of people will try to put something like this in their MLI file. Um, and that wouldn't that wouldn't work. <laughs> like you have to put that in your ML file and then, you know, use use type annotations or I believe what you could do is you could then in your MLI file, I think that works right to add list stack as the, as the type def, as the signature for, for this one. I think that works. I can't remember. But maybe the right way to do it is just type annotation. I forget. Um, yeah, I imagine you could do this module type, module type name equals, and then have like another module signature that you have defined. Maybe he'll get to that. Okay. That's confusing. I think this is a confusing way to explain it. Honestly, some of this is a little confusing just based on my actual experience. Like, I don't know. Like, yes, like he's right. You could do this, but I guess it's because he hasn't introduced MLI files. It's like, well, if it has the same name, actually you want to just put it in your MLI file, but that's fine. It's really funny. I don't think anybody would actually think that an all caps module name or value name is like shouting at you. I don't think anybody would think that. I mean, I understand that's a connotation in normal text, but I don't think people would think that in a code. Okay, whatever. That's fine. Uh, more syntax. We should also add syntax now for module type annotations. Module definitions may include an optional type annotation and module expressions may include manual type annotations. Yes. Uh-huh. 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 Okay. Module list stack alias list stack equals list stack. Module list stack alias equals list stack list stack. Sure, sure, sure. And module types can include nested module specifications, of course. Do, 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 looks good. What does a type annotation mean for modules? That is, what does it mean when we write the T in module in T? There are two properties the compiler guarantees, signature matching and opacity. Yeah, constant hinting in Python is really passive aggressive. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's like really common in Python, and a lot of people even do that in other uh I've seen it in closure even. Some people will do that. Uh for constants, which I mean everything's immutable in closure, but like if they have a top level constant, people will people will do all caps. But I I don't think I've ever seen that and been like yelling. People are yelling in their code. Uh, it's kind of weird. Uh, there are two properties, yeah, opacity and signature matching, sure. In Java, the extends keyword creates subtype relationships between classes, yes. So what is a subtype? Do, do, do. <sighs> For a language independent notion, we turn to Barbara Liskov. Let's go. She won the Turing Award in 2008 in part for her work on object-oriented language design. Let's not go. 
<laughs> That's a really good point, Avila. <laughs> you you have to be a little bit aggressive with Python if you want it to do the right thing, right? So that's why that's why you have to use all caps so much. Boom. Great joke. Okay. She won the Turing Award in 2008 in part for her work on object-oriented language design. I can't believe I had to read that twice. 20 years before that, she invented what is now called the Lizkov substitution principle to explain subtyping. It says that if S is a subtype of T, then substituting an object of type S for an object of type T should not change any desirable behaviors of a program. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Please don't rebind this name. <laughs> God, I do not miss doing that. I mean, closure is dynamic, but at least it's immutable. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> the particular flavor of subtyping in Java is called nominal subtyping, which is to say it is based on names. In our example, D is a subtype of C just because of the way the names were declared. The programmer decreed the subtype relationship and the language accepted the decree without question. Indeed, the only subtype relationships that exist are those that have been decreed by name through such use of extends and implements. So basically nominal versus structural is what he's explaining. Now it's time to return to OCaml. Its module system also uses subtyping with the same underlying intuition about the Liskov substitution principle, but OCaml uses a different flavor called structural subtyping. That is, it is based on the structure of modules rather than their names. Structure here simply means the definitions contained in the module. Those definitions are used to determine whether M has type of T is acceptable as a type annotation, where M is a module and T is a module type. Let's play with this idea of structure through several examples, starting with this module. Rage against the virtual machine, nice. <laughs> Uh, okay. Let's play with this idea of structure through several examples, starting with this module. Module M equals struct, let X equals zero, let Z equals two. Module M contains two definitions. You can see those in the structure signature for the module that OCaml outputs and contains X and Z because of the form of the module type annotation below is accepted. Yep, we can omit one of them. Same would work for Z, or for both X and Z, but not for Y, because M contains no such item. Okay? Not the worst, not the worst error in OCaml. That one's not so bad. That one's pretty good. I think that's just called Docker, yeah. Do, 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 do. Mm hmm. Sure. Also, pretty good error message. Types don't match between the values. Okay. I'm, I'm, we know from the definition of M that indeed does have a value of Z in, yet the error message strangely claims the value Z is required but not provided. It's MXZ. The reason for this error is that we've already supplied the type annotation X and the module expression M has type of X that causes the module expression to be known only at the module type, to be known only at the module type X. Okay, sure. We forgot irrevocably about the existence of Z after that annotation. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Sure. I'm going to read all that. Module types are static. Decisions about validity of module type annotations are made at compile time rather than runtime. You're on the same pet chapter. Nice. <laughs> module type annotations therefore offer potential confusion to programmers accustomed to object oriented languages in which subtyping works differently. Python programmers, for example, are accustomed to so-called duck typing. Python mentioned they might expect MXZ to be valid because Z does exist at runtime in M, but in OCaml, the compile time type of M has type of X has hidden Z from view irrevocably. Java programmers, on the other hand, might expect that module type annotations work like typecasts, so it might seem valid to first cast M to X, then to Z. In Java, such typecasts are checked as needed at runtime. But OCaml module type annotations are static. Once an annotation of X is made, there's no way to check at compile time what other items might exist in the module that would require a runtime check, which OCaml does not permit. In both cases, it might feel as though OCaml is being too restrictive. Nope. But in return for that restrictiveness, OCaml is guaranteeing an absence of runtime errors of the kind that would occur in Java or Python, whether because of a runtime error from a cast or a runtime error from a missing method. Modules are not as first class in OCaml's functions, but it is possible to package modules as first class values. Briefly, module M has type of T packages module M with module type T into a value. Val E has type of T, unpackages E into a module with type T. We won't cover this much further, but if you're curious, you can have a look at the manual. Manual. I can still read. All right. It's a long chapter. Or I'm just tired. <laughs> um, modules and the type level. Wow, he's using OCaml build in this in this video. Nice. We don't watch the videos. Uh, compiling an OCaml file produces a module having the same name as the file, but with the first letter capitalized. Yes, these compiled modules can be loaded into the top level using load. For example, suppose you create a file called mods.ml and put the following code in it. Note that there is no module mods equals struct end around that. The code is at the topmost level of the file, as it were. Then suppose you type OCamelC mods.ml to compile it. One of the newly created files is mods.cmo. Bytecode. This is a compiled module object file. You can make this bytecode available for use in the top level with the following directives. Recall that the hash character is required in front of a directive. It is not part of the prompt. Um, is that still how you do it? I feel like that's not how you do it anymore. I mean, what do we, what do we got here? We have my code.ml. Can't remember what's in my Dune project. Oh, just name hello. Okay. Um, I kind of thought I could put it. I could put this in with without any of that, but maybe not. Maybe I can't. For some reason, I thought I could just load the file directly. Guess I'm wrong. Um, okay, sure. We could move it, of course. You can do it with the use directive. Okay, that must be what I'm thinking of. Oh, there it is right there. OK. 
cannot find file. Well, why did you give me that weird option then? Okay, that's funny. So it did this and then it gave me this weird option instead of, oh, if I do this, it does give me a different option. Okay, no, you're right, it does work. Yeah, nice, thanks. I wonder if that wasn't used or, oh no, load versus use is down here. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It fails because ink is in the namespace of mods. Of course, if you open the module, sure. Dune provides a command to make it easier to start utop with libraries already loaded, which you can do dune utop, which is usually what I use. And initializing the type, the top level. If you're doing a lot of testing of a particular module, it can be annoying to have to type directives every time you start utop, okay? The solution is to create a file in the working directory and call that file.ocaml init. Okay. Um, and in that file, put the following code. Now restart utop with doing utop. Okay, I didn't know about this. Do people still use this? I imagine that they do. I didn't actually know that that was a thing. Well, that's cool. I like that. Uh, requiring library. Suppose you wanted to experiment with some O unit code in utop. You can't actually open it. Yeah, using require. Yeah, I haven't seen that in any code bases either, but that's kind of cool. Okay, I'm all in it. New learn, new learning. Uh, yeah. So you have to require libraries, but if you just use Dune you top, it I believe it lo it does this for all of your dependencies, if I remember right. Load versus use. There is a big difference between loading a compiled module file and using. There's a big difference. Okay. There's a big difference stuck in for a loop. Just kidding. And using an uncompiled source file. The former loads bytecode and makes it available for use. For example, loading mods.cmo caused the mod module to be available, and we could access its members with expressions like mod.b. The latter use is textual inclusion. Okay, so it's basically like include mods.ml because it brings everything into the current scope of the top level. Okay, that's the difference. But we can't actually do that unless we compile it first, basically. Um, yep. So that's why if we just used OCaml C, we could then load it in if we wanted to that way. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. I think my, uh, I don't, I don't know how people can do this for eight hours. Like, like Tej and, uh, bad cop reading a book for eight hours. Like, my voice is like already basically done. It's it's pretty wild. There's just a there's a difference. Like I could stream for a lot longer, just casually talking, but like actually reading, man, it's a lot. It's a lot more. It's a lot more talking. Um, let's uh, let's try to get through one more section here. Let's see, or not. We did it. We we so did it. This is so good. I'm so glad we did that. All right. Uh, I think actually I'm probably done. I'd rather I'd rather have enough voice to stream again tomorrow than for me to hurt my throat. <laughs> uh, I think I'm still going to stream tomorrow, even though it's a holiday because we're not celebrating until uh, another day. So. Uh, a U.S. holiday, that is, for the most part. I don't think I don't think too many other people. I mean, do, do people do people celebrate Easter? 
other places? I don't actually know. I mean, I know more like, you know, there's there's other other things. Yeah, it's just a U.S. thing, right? Okay. Um, just another co-opted Christian holiday. Love it. In the U.S. only. U.S. only Christian holiday. Let's go. Uh, Ranastra is coding. Thanks for the follow. I appreciate it. So I'll most likely stream tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we'll, we should be keep going through this, maybe finish chapter five, start on some exercises. We're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, there's, it, it'll be interesting to see like how much, like what is actually worth going through in some of these. I mean, data structures, I think will be great. Um, mutability. I, I don't think that's going to take that long to go through. Mostly know what I want to know about that. Uh, correctness. That'd be a little interesting. See what that's about. But I feel like this has been like, I mean, it makes sense that, th that there's so much information on modules. Modules is kind of like the whole, the whole gig, the whole shtick for OCaml. So there's that. Um, okay. So you, yeah, Good Friday is a lot more like international. Bye, you.